présenter. Bonjour à tous. On a, on a vraiment beaucoup de chance et je pense qu'il faut en être conscient de pouvoir entendre au, tout, au cours de ces trois jours d'aussi nombreuses personnalités européenne. On va se rendre compte que les questions qu'on se pose, qui sont difficiles, sont aussi posées dans d'autres pays. On s'en est rendu compte au Congrès d'Alzheimer Europe début septembre. Ça se pose dans tous les pays, pas seulement en Europe. On a en particulier la chance d'avoir trois personnalités de tout premier plan. Et c'est important aussi de les avoir physiquement, ou même visuellement présentes. L'ONU, ça semble parfois loin. La Commission européenne aussi parfois. Et de pouvoir engager une discussion véritable avec eux et pas simplement sur des mécompréhensions ou des postures euh, me semble très important. Alors Paula Bolbaum, le professeur Paul Applebaum, dont vous allez entendre l'exposé tout de suite, est professeur de psychiatrie à l'Université Columbia de New York. Il est directeur de la division psychiatrie, droit et éthique de ce département de psychiatrie, avec une spécialité en psychiatrie légale. Il a fait ses études de médecine à Harvard et les travaux dont il a fait état remontent euh, à la fin des années 70. Le début de ses travaux remonte à la fin des années 70, quand je crois il était résident à la faculté de médecine de Harvard. Il est bien sûr l'auteur de nombreux articles, ouvrages sur l'éthique et le droit de la clinique psychiatrique. Il est membre de l'Académie des sciences américaines. Il est très investi, un ancien président de l'Association américaine de psychiatrie. Il est aussi très investi dans l'association mondiale de psychiatrie, notamment sur les questions d'éthique, et il a très récemment reçu, pas récemment reçu un, un prix, le prix Isaac Ray de l'association américaine de psychiatrie pour ses contributions, et c'est important, à la psychiatrie légale et aux aspects psychiatriques de la jurisprudence. Alors je suis très honoré et aussi très ému de l'introduire parce que je crois avoir été l'un des premiers en, en France à essayer de faire connaître ses travaux, à les discuter et, et à montrer leur intérêt. Ces deux questions, en fait, très simples que vous euh, rencontrez tous, je crois, que ce soit dans votre vie professionnelle et parfois dans votre vie privée. Les deux questions que le professeur s'est posées, c'est la première. Quand dans un contexte de soins de santé, une personne refuse des soins ou des traitements ou une hospitalisation, en particulier quand elle a des troubles des fonctions mentales, des troubles des, troubles des fonctions intellectuelles ou cognitives, se pose parfois la question de sa compétence et du caractère éclairé de son refus. A l'inverse, dans le contexte de la recherche biomédicale, quand une personne accepte d'entrer dans un protocole de recherche et qu'elle a par ailleurs des troubles cognitifs intellectuels ou des troubles des fonctions mentales et que dans ce protocole il y a des risques, la question, la valeur ou le, le statut de son consentement, de son acceptation peut être interrogée. Il y a un double enjeu, vous le voyez évidemment. Là. La première, c'est que si vous laissez prendre à une personne dont les capacités sont réduites, si vous la laissez prendre seule ses décisions, ça risque de s'apparenter à de la négligence. A l'inverse, si vous empêchez une personne de décider par elle-même ou pour elle-même, si vous lui retirez arbitrairement la possibilité de prendre ses décisions, ce qui est un droit fondamental, c'est une atteinte à ses droits fondamentaux et à sa dignité. Donc la question qui se pose, c'est la question de la capacité mentale, de la compétence, de la capacité à consentir. Et euh, avant les travaux de Paul Applebaum, il y avait deux approches de ces questions. La première qu'on appelle « approche par le statut », c'est-à-dire que dès lors que vous aviez atteint un certain âge ou que vous aviez certaines maladies, on présumait que vous étiez plus compétent. Autrement dit, il y avait une présomption d'incapacité globale, une approche globale de la compétence. Et puis l'autre approche que vous connaissez bien aussi, c'est ce qu'on appelle l'approche par le résultat, « outcome approach », c'est vous jugez incompétente une personne qui prend une décision dont vous avez le sentiment qu est, que sa décision n'est pas bonne, que sa décision est raisonnable, que sa décision pourrait être discutée. Alors les, 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 j'en ai, ai fini, mais il y a deux originalités que je voudrais vraiment marquer avec force du, du travail de Paul Applebaum. La première, c'est que pour répondre à ces questions, qui sont des questions très fréquentes sur le terrain et très difficiles à résoudre, c'est qu'il s'est dit il nous faut des critères de la compétence décisionnelle, de la capacité à consentir. Et pour cela, il est allé voir la jurisprudence américaine. Ce choix-là, il est décisif. Derrière, il y a l'idée que dans une, dans une société démocratique, Seul un juge peut, en théorie, retirer à une personne l'exercice ou le pouvoir ou le, le, le droit d'exercer un certain nombre, de, de prendre elle-même ses décisions. Donc dans le, le fait d'aller regarder la jurisprudence, il y a quel est dans la société donnée à au moment de son histoire qui est le mien, quels sont actuellement les critères qui sont utilisés par ceux qui sont légalement reconnus, en tout cas reconnus comme légitimes, pour prendre ce genre de décision. 
La deuxième chose, c'est qu'il ne s'est pas contenté d'essayer de, de tirer des critères d'un examen de la jurisprudence, c'est qu'il a essayé d'opérationnaliser ces critères dans un certain nombre d'outils. Tous ces outils commencent par Mac. CAT, MAC parce que c'est la fondation MacArthur qui a en partie financé cette recherche, et CAT pour Competence Assessment Test, test d'évaluation de la compétence. Euh, ces outils, euh, il y en a un certain nombre, je pense qu'il va nous parler essentiellement des outils pour évaluer la, la capacité à consentir à des soins et la capacité à consentir à entrer dans un protocole de recherche. Je voudrais dire qu'à l'heure actuelle, notamment en Amérique du Nord, il y a beaucoup d'outils euh, divers pour évaluer la capacité à consentir à des soins. À ma connaissance, il n'y en a aucun en France. Euh, il y a beaucoup d'outils, euh, mais celui qu'a présenté euh, le professeur Paul Applebaum reste le gold standard pour tous les autres. Deuxièmement, euh, dans les comités d'éthique de la recherche américains, qu'on appelle les IRB, les, la plupart des IRB américains recommandent que, quand il y a un protocole de recherche, on euh, évalue la capacité à consentir des personnes et donc on procède à une évaluation formelle de la capacité, notamment quand c'est un protocole qui suppose un certain nombre de risques. En France, il euh, y a un bébé d'outils Applebaum qui a été traduit et adapté en français sur la euh, recherche par l'équipe de Laurence Hugonneau. Et il y a actuellement un PHRC euh, euh, qui est en cours, un protocole hospitalier de recherche clinique qui est actuellement en cours pour traduire, adapter, valider en français euh, les outils sur la capacité au consentir aux soins à la désignation d'un tiers, une personne de confiance ou un mandataire, euh, et euh, pour le droit de vote, me semble-t-il. Donc l'important, c'est que ce n'est pas seulement des outils, je pense que le professeur va vous le rappeler, que ce n'est pas simplement des outils pour objectiver, c'est des outils qui ne se substituent pas au jugement du clinicien ou du professionnel, qui sont là pour l'éclairer, pour l'alimenter. Et donc je, on, je pense que c'est une, une, une présentation particulièrement intéressante pour prendre, essayer de prendre connaissance de ces critères et de ces outils pour les discuter. C'est pourquoi je vous remonte, de, demande de réserver le plus chaleureux accueil à Paul Applebaum. Thank you for that introduction and thanks to the organizers of the meeting for uh, inviting me to, to be here with you today. So by way of preface to my uh, presentation, let me say that you can consider it in one of two ways. Uh, it is either emblematic of the outdated paradigm that uh, needs to be abandoned and from which uh, we need to uh, develop new approaches, uh, or alternatively, as I'll suggest at the end of my presentation, Uh, perhaps the uh, understanding and approach embedded in this uh, uh, presentation, uh, in fact, becomes even more important now that we have the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, and uh, we take seriously, uh, finally, uh, in our history, uh, what it means uh, to have rights and uh, to be able to, uh, to exercise them. And you'll judge for yourself. So when we think about uh, decision making, uh, I would suggest that uh, we think of three elements. Uh, the first is uh, information. Uh, without the basic information about the decision at hand, no one can make uh, a meaningful choice. So if it's a decision about getting married, hopefully you've known the person for more than just one very exciting evening. Uh, if it's a decision about uh, managing your uh, assets, hopefully you know what those assets are and you know what your choices are for their uh, disposition. If it's a decision about medical treatment, uh, which has been a primary focus uh, of our work, uh, to make a meaningful decision, you need to know something about the condition that you have, the options for treatment, what their risks and benefits might be and what alternatives there are to uh, the recommended uh, options. Uh, and because we recognize that ordinary people lack that information, uh, we have implemented an approach that uh, around the world now is called informed consent uh, to treatment and we require physicians to provide that information to patients uh, before uh, they're asked to make their choice. 
So information is clearly one piece of what we need in order to make any kind of uh, meaningful decision. Uh, a second uh, piece uh, is uh, competence, or sometimes capacity. And I use those terms interchangeably, and, and uh, there are other terms uh, that sometimes get used uh, as well. Uh, and the focus of this presentation, of course, is on what we mean uh, by competence, so I'll defer the discussion uh, of that for a moment, other than to say some characteristics of the individual's cognitive functioning uh, are relevant to their ability to use that information that they have or have obtained in order to make uh, a choice. Uh, and finally, voluntariness. Uh, which is to say that a person must be so situated as to be able to make a choice in the absence of coercion such that the choice represents their own will rather than someone else's uh, will and not a particularly uh, controversial uh, proposition. Why that second requirement? Why that requirement for uh, a competent uh, decision? Uh, I would suggest that there are uh, two reasons, uh, and perhaps you can think of uh, others. There are at least two reasons. Uh, the first is that we are interested in a democratic society in promoting and maintaining and reinforcing the autonomy of uh, our citizens. Uh, and uh, one way we do that is by saying that there are competent choices uh, are inviolable. That is, uh, they have the absolute right uh, to make uh, whatever choice they desire, even choices that would not be consensually validated, choices that would not reflect uh, the options that most people uh, would choose, uh, so long as they have some minimal degree of cognitive uh, capacity to uh, deal with the information uh, involved. Uh, second, we recognize uh, that uh, as between you and a third party, you are better able to determine what's in your own interests uh, than the third party uh, is. Uh, and so long as uh, you retain that ability to process the information that is relevant uh, to that uh, choice that you're faced with, uh, you and not someone else should be making uh, that choice. Uh, conversely, uh, when you can no longer uh, deal with the information in such a way uh, as to uh, reflect your autonomous uh, wishes uh, or to promote your own well-being, uh, sadly, in those cases, someone else may need to make uh, the decision uh, on your behalf, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, how that works uh, as well. So what is this thing that we call competence? I want to suggest that it has at least three general characteristics, and then we'll talk more about the specific standards that uh, are applied. Uh, first, these days, uh, really for the last 50 years, uh, we've come to recognize uh, that competence is uh, often not an all or nothing proposition. Uh, but competence is specific to the question at hand. Uh, so you may not be competent anymore by virtue of mild uh, Alzheimer's disease, for example, uh, to manage your assets, to remember to deposit the checks in your bank account, to pay your bills uh, every month, uh, but you may still be quite competent to decide where you want to live. Uh, or with whom you want to associate, uh, or even to make some decisions about your medical treatment. Do you want a flu shot uh, or uh, not? Uh, and though we once asked as a blanket matter, all or nothing, competent or not competent, uh, over the last 50 years, uh, we've come to recognize uh, that although there are some people who are generally incompetent, think of someone who's comatose, for example, or has an advanced case of uh, dementia, many other people uh, have specific incapacities limited to uh, focal areas of their lives, uh, and they are incapable in those areas, but capable in many other uh, parts uh, of their lives. 
The second thing we've come to recognize uh, about uh, competence is that uh, it is task specific by which uh, I mean that uh, you may be competent uh, for one task, uh, but not for uh, another, uh, even within the same category of task. Uh, so as an example, uh, in the medical treatment realm, uh, faced with a simple choice, uh, taking antibiotics for uh, a urinary tract infection, which is uncomfortable and painful, uh, and you need uh, the treatment, that's a relatively simple choice. Most people uh, can understand uh, what's at stake, and even many people with considerable degrees uh, of impairment uh, are easily able to uh, make a choice about taking uh, that uh, medication. On the other hand, uh, a complex choice about uh, heart valve replacement surgery, uh, which has a certain degree of mortality risk uh, during the course of the procedure, uh, which will require taking anticoagulants after the procedure, which itself increases uh, risk of morbidity uh, and mortality, uh, which uh, may have implications for uh, one's uh, lifestyle, uh, whether or not one has uh, the surgery. Uh, that's a choice uh, that involves taking into account so many different factors uh, that the same person who's able to make a decision about taking antibiotics for urinary tract infection may not be able to make uh, a decision about mitral valve uh, surgery, uh, for example. And that is what we mean by task uh, specificity. Thirdly, competence also has a temporal aspect. Competence may change over time because many of the conditions that impair competence change over time. So to take a simple example, many patients with early to moderate Alzheimer's uh, disease uh, exhibit a phenomenon that uh, in the United States we call sundowning. Uh, that means that uh, when they first wake up uh, in the morning, uh, they uh, are alert, bright, capable, and able to make um, many choices uh, in their lives in a uh, competent way. But at this time of day, as the sun is going down, uh, as they're losing visual cues because it's uh, getting darker uh, outside, as they get tired, uh, as a result of, of their physical effort uh, during the day, they may simply not have the attentional capacity or the information processing capacity to make the same choice they could have made eight hours uh, earlier. So there's a short-term temporal specificity uh, in some cases. Uh, there's also a cyclical uh, specificity associated with uh, many psychiatric uh, illnesses. Uh, Bipolar disorder is probably the classical uh, example uh, with episodes that can be quite severe and quite impairing uh, that come and go over time with intervals in between of absolutely uh, normal uh, functioning. But even more severe and, and uh, uh, persistent uh, psychotic disorder, schizophrenia for example, uh, is marked by periods of acute exacerbation uh, when people are severely psychotic and less able to function, uh, and periods of relatively fewer symptoms uh, when choices can be made more easily. So if those are the general characteristics uh, of competence, uh, how do we know whether I, for example, am uh, competent or not? So you've already heard that there is, uh, in most uh, uh, countries today, a presumption of competence. We're all presumed to have capacity uh, for the decisions uh, that we make, and that has been true in the United States for 60 or 70 years now. That's not a new uh, part of the uh, paradigm. Anyone who would prove that I lack capacity, uh, who would seek to prove it, uh, must bear the burden of proof uh, of that uh, assertion. And in bearing the burden of proof, uh, when we uh, look across, and as you heard, we, we uh, develop these uh, 
this model of the elements of competence uh, by looking at uh, case law, how judges actually uh, decided uh, these cases. But we also looked at the philosophical literature, the bioethical literature, uh, the sociological literature, and the medical and psychological literatures. Uh, and what we found, actually somewhat to our surprise, was although the words differed in those different categories, because different disciplines use different terms, in general, people were talking about one or more of the same concepts, uh, and these are the four concepts uh, that they were uh, talking about. So, to go through them uh, quickly, uh, first, uh, in order to determine whether somebody has the capacity to make a choice, uh, we ask, uh, can they evidence a choice? That is, can they make known to other people what their choice is? Most commonly, that's by way of speech, but it could be by way of writing. Uh, for people with, with certain uh, kinds of neurological impairment, it may be by blinking their eyes or uh, nodding their heads. Uh, but communication of a choice is uh, a prima facie requirement uh, for being capable of uh, making that choice. And if you can't communicate your choice, of necessity someone else uh, will have to make that choice uh, for you. The second component of uh, competence uh, is uh, understanding, understanding of the information that is relevant uh, to that uh, choice. There's a certain uh, again, common sense uh, appeal to the notion uh, that if you don't understand uh, what your medical condition is or what uh, the treatment for it involves, if you don't understand what your assets are uh, and uh, to whom uh, you could be leaving them uh, when you uh, die, uh, in one case you're not competent to make a medical treatment decision, in the other you're not competent to write a will, that is, you lack testamentary uh, capacity. Uh, but understanding may not be enough, and it may not be enough uh, given the nature of uh, mental disorders and other mental uh, impairments. And that's where the appreciation component uh, comes along. Uh, appreciation asks not only can a person understand the relevant information in an abstract way, but does the person have the capacity to apply it to their own situation? So what's the difference? Well, to take a, a classical uh, example, uh, many people with uh, schizophrenia, uh, some, uh, not in substantial number with bipolar uh, disorder, uh, can understand uh, what the doctor is telling them about having an illness, the illness is called schizophrenia, there's a treatment for the illness, the treatment has uh, these risks and benefits, uh, but they will say in response, I understand you're telling me about schizophrenia, uh, but I don't know why you're telling me about that because I don't have schizophrenia, there's nothing wrong with me. In fact, if you think I have schizophrenia, you're the one who's uh, crazy. Uh, or bipolar disorder, uh, or early stages of uh, dementia, and sometimes other uh, disorders as well. The very nature of some of these mental disorders distorts the capacity uh, to reflect on one's own state. Uh, neurologists call this condition anosognosia. Uh, you can see it in stroke uh, cases uh, as well. Uh, and in the absence of that appreciation that I really do have schizophrenia, I really did have a stroke, I really am suffering from uh, early dementia, uh, the uh, accepted view is that the person is in no position to be able to make a decision for himself or herself uh, about the treatment of that disorder, for example. And finally, reasoning. Uh, the capacity to uh, reason uh, is to take the information that's been abstractly understood uh, and uh, appreciated, applied to one's own situation, uh, and to weigh it in some sort of process that involves a comparison of risks and benefits. Uh, and uh, in general, this is something that we do implicitly. Uh, when we all make uh, our uh, decisions, but we do it. 
uh, we decide to go to the movies rather than uh, doing our, uh, uh, our homework if we're a, a student uh, because um, we've decided we're willing to take the risk of not having the homework done tomorrow morning for the pleasure of uh, going to the, uh, to the cinema. Uh, it may or may not be a good choice, but we've made it on the basis of uh, weighing our uh, options. So those are the four component elements of uh, competence. Which of those elements and at what degree where the cutoff uh, is uh, will vary uh, in application uh, across jurisdictions although most jurisdictions of which I'm aware, and I don't just mean the United States now, this is true in uh, much of continental Europe, in England, Australia, Canada uh, as well, uh, will apply all four of those elements of uh, competence. There are some jurisdictions that don't. There's one state in the United States, Wisconsin, uh, in which uh, only evidencing a choice and understanding uh, are relevant. They don't ask about appreciation uh, or reasoning, uh, and uh, one could see uh, other jurisdictions uh, varying it uh, as well. Moreover, uh, which elements one looks at and uh, where one sets the threshold? How much do I have to understand? Uh, how good does my reasoning have to be? Uh, might well vary and does in practice vary according to the risk of the decision that is uh, at issue. So for a low risk decision, do I get a flu shot or not? Uh, low levels of capacity are adequate to make that uh, choice and our concern about your making uh, a bad decision is less. Uh, for high risk procedures, cardiac surgery, uh, for example, uh, we reasonably would require higher levels of uh, capacity. Assessing uh, capacity uh, using this framework can be done in a relatively straightforward way. And I just want to give you some examples of the words that an evaluator, usually a physician, although it doesn't have to be a physician, uh, can use uh, to perform this assessment. So for understanding, um, Please tell me in your own words what your doctor told you about the nature of your condition, what's wrong with you, uh, what treatment has been recommended, what are the benefits, what are the risks, and what do you understand about the alternatives uh, to the proposed treatment along with their risks and uh, benefits. With regard to appreciation, tell me what you really believe is wrong with your health now. Do you believe you need some kind of treatment? Why or why not? What's that treatment likely to do for you? And what do you believe will happen if you don't have uh, that treatment? With regard to manifesting a choice, evidencing a choice, have you decided whether to go along with your doctor's suggestions for treatment? Can you tell me what your decision is? And finally, reasoning. Tell me how you reached the decision to accept or reject the treatment, what factors were important to you in, in your choice, and how did, you, how did you balance those factors? Sometimes I say to patients, just think aloud for me. I just want to understand what you were thinking when you uh, made that choice. Now, there's nothing sacred about these words. You can change them. You can modify them. It's the concepts that are uh, important, and I think they can be embodied relatively simply in a clinical uh, evaluation. However, uh, we know that when physicians conduct these evaluations in an unstructured uh, way, uh, the reliability of their determinations is low. That is, uh, the inter-rater reliability, the extent to which one physician's view would correspond uh, with another, is relatively low. Uh, in the absence of somewhat greater structure uh, to the evaluation. Uh, and so, as, as you heard, uh, along with my colleague Tom Grizzo, some years ago, uh, we developed uh, a set of instruments, tools, uh, to standardize uh, the approach to competence uh, assessment. And the advantages of using a standardized uh, set of tools are that it ensures that the evaluator collects all the relevant data, 
provides a structure for doing so. Sometimes when you're in the middle of an evaluation, frankly, uh, there's a noise outside, your phone rings, you get paged, uh, the patient has a coughing fit, uh, there's an interruption uh, because somebody walks into the room and you forget something. Well, when you use an instrument, uh, you don't have that uh, problem. It provides a way of documenting a person's performance and it also allows you to track their change uh, over time. And one of the instruments, which uh, I'm happy to talk uh, more about, but I'm not going to go into great detail on, uh, which is the one we developed, the MCAT-T, uh, the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool uh, for Treatment, uh, is uh, an attempt to uh, embody uh, this uh, approach. Uh, it involves uh, the disclosure of information in an individualized way relevant to this patient's uh, treatment. Following, followed by questions that probe how well they've uh, understood the information, how well they appreciate it, how well they can reason uh, about it with a structured uh, scoring system that's been demonstrated to be uh, quite reliable. And as I said, I can say more uh, about that. But one of the things that when I teach uh, psychiatrists uh, or other physicians about doing uh, these evaluations uh, that I think is key uh, is how they conceptualize the goal. And in my view, the goal is not to try to take decision-making power away from the patient. It's to try to help them retain their decision-making power, if at all possible. Uh, and so even in the case uh, that serious impairment is identified and the physician believes that the patient may be incapable of uh, consenting uh, to treatment, uh, I urge them uh, to defer that decision, to defer turning to an alternative uh, decision maker while some effort is made to ameliorate those deficiencies, to fix them. And what are some uh, examples? Uh, some people do better with written material than with uh, verbal material. Uh, some people need diagrams or these days computerized uh, videos uh, that can help them uh, understand the information better. Uh, some people have uh, language problems. Uh, in our country, English is not many people's first language uh, and a translator in their native language uh, may be uh, helpful. Some of these you can think of as support, supported uh, decision making, although I don't use that term uh, here on the slide. Uh, nonetheless, I, I think uh, they could reasonably be construed in that way. Sometimes medical interventions uh, are needed. People who are extraordinarily anxious and so anxious that they can't even focus on the information uh, may need approaches, whether it's behavioral therapy or medication, to reduce their anxiety. If they have an underlying medical condition that's causing them, for example, to be delirious, uh, that condition needs to be uh, treated. And sometimes simply providing situational supports is all it takes. Patients who are frightened, they're in the hospital, they're facing uh, serious choices and a serious medical condition, uh, and are all alone and are asked to make a decision may have a great deal of difficulty doing so. Bringing in a friend, a family member, uh, a clergy person, uh, someone they trust and know uh, can make all the difference in the world in helping them talk through and think through uh, their uh, options and you can think of that as supportive decision making uh, as well. Let me, for the sake of time, uh, just uh, skip to this uh, question. What if, despite all your efforts, despite bringing in a friend and simplifying the disclosure and showing them a video and uh, bringing in a translator, uh, the patient still lacks adequate understanding, uh, lacks appreciation, can't reason, is confused, uh, what if the patient is still incapable uh, of making uh, a choice? Uh, in that case, uh, the decision has to be made in some other way. Uh, options include uh, advanced directives, I'll say more about that in a second, turning to family members, or uh, having the court make uh, the choice. 
There are a number of standards uh, for a substituted decision maker uh, to make a choice on behalf of uh, an incapable uh, person. Uh, and in the United States now, a hierarchy has developed, uh, a ladder of um, approaches uh, from most preferable to least preferable depending on the circumstances. So everyone agrees the most preferable choice is the explicit decision of the patient uh, that uh, the patient has made while competent. Uh, sometimes patients complete documents that are called advanced directives or living wills, the names uh, differ, uh, that say explicitly, if I'm in this situation, this is what I want and this is what I don't want, and that's always the best way of uh, dealing with things. Uh, but when the patient has not made uh, known their explicit uh, choice, um, one is left needing to make a decision in some other way. Uh, the second best option, then, is what's called substituted judgment, which is to ask the decision maker to make a decision on the basis of, as best he or she can tell, what the patient's choice would have been if the patient were competent uh, right now, based on the patient's values, on their history, uh, not always an easy determination uh, to make, uh, very difficult, maybe impossible to use for people who have never been competent, people, for example, who have severe intellectual disabilities uh, from birth, uh, but nonetheless, uh, an effort to embody the individual's choice and maintain their autonomy despite uh, their incapacity. But sometimes we don't know uh, what the person uh, would have chosen. We don't know the person, we don't know enough about them, it's an urgent situation, a decision needs to be made, and in that case we take the third best option, uh, which is the traditional best interest standard. I will do what is in this person's medical best interest, what the majority of people would have chosen in this uh, circumstance, uh, but arguably perhaps not what this person would have chosen, but we don't know, we don't know. The broad-scale application of a best interest standard fell into disfavor uh, in the 20th century and was replaced by substituted judgment and advanced directives, but I would suggest it still retains a role in some number of uh, cases. And so what I've called here the modern approach, we go with the patient's choice if we know what it is. If we can, in the absence of an explicit choice, we substitute our judgment for theirs, but relying on what we think their values and their choices would be, uh, and as a last resort, we make a decision in their best interest. So I, in closing, I just want to uh, bring this to the uh, CRPD and say just something briefly about uh, its relevance. If you read the convention itself, I would suggest to you that the role of competence and competence assessment is uh, ambiguous. Uh, you could read the convention, and I'm leaving the general comment aside for the moment, as encouraging individual decision making whenever possible. And if that's the way you read it, then it's consistent with this approach because competence assessment is required to determine when it is possible for an individual to make his or her own uh, decision. On the other hand, if you read it, as some people do, uh, as never permitting substitute decision making, uh, then uh, this approach is irrelevant, but then I would suggest that the convention's approach is simply unworkable uh, in the real uh, world. Uh, and this is Article 12, Section 4 of the convention, and I've selectively highlighted uh, some phrases here. Uh, the safeguards, safeguards should be put into place that ensure that measures relating to the exercise of legal capacity are proportional and tailored to the person's circumstances, apply for the shortest time possible, and are subject to regular review. To me, that suggests that unless you were conceiving of the option in appropriate cases of a mechanism for substituted decision making, these words would be irrelevant. And I choose not to believe that the framers of the convention uh, thought that they were irrelevant. 
So I want to close uh, with a, a story, an anecdote, a personal story, because like Gabor, I have a story about my mother uh, as well. Uh, I lived uh, for many years in Boston, which is about 220 miles north of New York, and my mother lived in, in New York. Uh, and one, one evening, uh, I received a phone call from a neighbor of my mother's saying that I should know that my mother was uh, walking up and down on the street, uh, the block that she lived on, uh, looking into cars and uh, muttering uh, to herself for hours. She'd been doing this. And the neighbor was very worried. So my wife and I got into the car. We drove through the night uh, to get there. We got there in, in the early hours uh, of the morning. Uh, and it was clear that my mother was uh, extremely confused and uh, psychotic. And it turned out that this was the first sign that we'd had uh, that she was uh, experiencing the early onset of dementia, which sometimes initially presents with a confusional psychotic-like uh, state. So we persuaded her to get into a car, and we took her to a psychiatric uh, facility, which I knew to be uh, a good one, and um, she was admitted involuntarily. She didn't want to come in because she didn't think there was anything wrong. And even when she was discharged from the facility and was uh, still no longer psychotic in that same way, but still uh, sufficiently confused that she could not deposit the checks she received from her pension. Uh, she couldn't write the checks, or wouldn't, or didn't write the checks for uh, electricity, uh, gas, uh, phone, uh, and the other bills that she needed uh, to pay. Uh, it was clear uh, that somebody had to do that uh, for her. But she had always been very uh, careful about uh, the management of her money and was unwilling to let anyone else do it, even me. And I'm the only, I was the only child in the family. And so we went to court. Uh, we've got a lawyer and petitioned for uh, a declaration of incapacity and the appointment of a guardian. Uh, and there was a hearing and she was represented by an attorney and there was a guardian ad litem appointed a lawyer who did an independent investigation uh, of the situation and made a recommendation to the court and I was called to testify uh, and uh, ultimately uh, she was determined by a judge to be incompetent uh, and I was appointed uh, as uh, her guardian. Uh, and so um, I wrote the checks uh, for her uh, bills. We ultimately moved her to an assisted living facility where she was uh, very happy and supported in living as independent a life as she could within uh, a protected uh, environment for a, a number of, a surprising number of uh, additional years uh, of her life. That she didn't end her life being hit by a car roaming up and down the street where she lived uh, or losing her house because she failed to pay her water and sewer and electricity uh, bills, or exhausting the resources that supported her in comfort in her later years uh, because of inappropriate expenditures. Those were all due to the fact that a mechanism was available for her to be determined, incapable of making her own decisions, and to permit someone else uh, to make them uh, for her. And I would suggest that that is a reasonable use of the incapacity uh, criterion and a mechanism for substituted uh, decision making. And I, for one, would have been unwilling to sacrifice my mother for the sake of what Amita referred to as an empowering legal fiction. And that may be the difference between medical and legal perspectives, and I accept that, but I want you to understand my perspective for uh, what it is. So thank you. <laughs>